What's the difference between the brain and the mind, or is there any difference? The mind is a series of processes carried out by the brain. So the brain is responsible for every mental process that you carry out, from simple reflex acts like hitting a backhand in tennis to the most creative acts of television journalism. And one of the great contributions of 19th century brain science is to show that different functions, different mental functions, are localized to different regions or combinations of regions in the brain. Broca in 1860 first showed that a lesion on the left side in the front of the brain is responsible for articulation of language. If you have a deficit there, you understand language perfectly well, but you can't express it. Right. A lesion on the same side in the back of the brain, Wernicke showed, is responsible for you understanding language. You could articulate it, but you don't understand it. So that first made us realize that a complex function like language has specific localizations in the brain. And help me with a definition. Neuroplasticity. What's the definition of neuroplasticity? Neuroplasticity is the ability of the brain to change its behavior as a result of experience. Mm -hmm. If we carry on a conversation or we have a pleasant afternoon together and you and I remember that tomorrow or a week from now, it's because our brain has been modified as a result of that experience. How does the brain change and grow? When one learns something, signals are sent into the brain that activate modulatory pathways that cause the connections between nerve cells to change in function. If you remember something very briefly, like a telephone number, you remember it for five or 10 minutes, it's a functional change that regresses back to its previous state. If something is very important for you, like meeting Dan Rathers or having an opportunity to do something interesting, um, you remember it for longer periods of time. Or if you repeat something, that actually gives rise to anatomical changes. So that means that every single person has a slightly different brain than every other person. Identical twins with identical genes have somewhat different brains because they will have different life experiences. And one of the interesting things about how you grow those connections is that the signals that are sent to nerve cells to grow new connections alter the expressions of genes in the brain. People are astonished to hear that because they think the genes are the controllers of the environment. They think we are what we are because of our genes, but they don't realize that the genes are also the servants of experience. When people interact to give rise to long-term memory, they do this by altering gene expression, and it's the expression of genes that is responsible for the growth of new connections. Do you or do you not find people still surprised by the plastic quality of the ever-changing brain? Well, I think it's one of the great insights of the last 30 or 40 years. Let me give you an example. There are some kids that are born with a large cyst in the left hemisphere. Terrible. Um, that interferes with the areas involved in language, Broca's and Wernicke. If you interfere with those areas in the adult person, it's very bad news. But in young children, you can take out the whole left hemisphere. This has been done in Hopkins the right hemisphere takes over and develops the capability for speech. This is almost, I'm tempted to say, miraculous. Miraculous in terms of our understanding 50 years ago. Um, so I'm giving you the most remarkable example of plasticity we know. We're moving a whole hemisphere, including all the functions in it, the God-given function, so to speak, <laughs> and you find it in the other hemisphere. Now, so let's talk about your past. My past. And begin with the distant past. Uh, you've written about your childhood and about the Nazi concentration camps during the occupation of uh, Austria, and you were a boy during this period. Yes. Did the memory of those unquestionably traumatic events, is that what got you into the study of the mind and the brain? Absolutely. It's had a profound influence on me. I laugh because I think the, in the influence is so 
interesting and in some ways funny. So there are two aspects of it. One is science and the other is my obsession about Vienna. <laughs> so I left Vienna in 1939 because we were going to get killed if we stayed there. Uh, and I came to Brooklyn. I went to Erasmus Hall High School. And at Erasmus, I got interested in history. I wanted to understand how people who could read Goethe and Schiller, who could listen to Haydn, Mozart, and Beethoven one day, go out and beat up Jews the next day. It was incomprehensible to me that I would meet a classmate the day after Hitler came into Vienna, and he would say to me, Kandel, my father said I'm never to talk to you again. Unbelievable. And I try to come to grips with that. So I began to study German and Austrian history. I went to Harvard. I majored in history and literature, and I wrote my thesis on the attitude toward national socialism of three German writers to understand how could intellectuals get involved with Hitler. While there, I got interested through a woman that I met in psychoanalysis. And her parents were major analysts in New York, and they said to me, history is not the way to understand the human mind, it's through psychoanalysis. So I began to read Freud, and I was fascinated by Freud. I, I even read some Freud in the 1950s. Not a lot, it was, mind you. <laughs> it was an exciting new direction, and he right. writes so well. So I thought, you know, I would go to medical school with the idea of becoming an analyst. And I went to medical school with one idea. And then in my senior year, there was a six-month elective period, and we could do whatever we wanted. And I thought even a psychoanalyst should know something about the brain. So I took an elective actually here at Columbia, and I got hooked. And at the time, 1956, when I graduated from medical school, physicians were being drafted. And those who were qualified could go to the NIH. I was selected by the NIH, and I spent three magnificent years there, and I learned how to do science. But you didn't start out to be a, a doctor, a medical doctor. I not only didn't start out to be a doctor, I knew nothing about science. I had no interest in science. I was you didn't take pre-med at Harvard? I took the three required courses. I took them because they were prerequisites, not because I liked any of them. I didn't <laughs> like them. I got interested in science because I decided an analyst should know something about the brain. And I started to do it. Not only that, but we learn about science by reading books or doing road experiments. Mm -hmm. the, working in a lab is a completely different experience. It's mm -hmm. like a Talmudic experience. You're debating, should we do this, should we do that? Mm -hmm. You know, is this a good idea? It's a, so much more intellectual. It's so much, it's a way of taking small degrees of, of creativity and amplifying them. So I found it just magical. And I continue to find it magical. Look, I'm not a young guy, but I work every single day doing science, and it's just addictive. Talk to you about how the brain makes memories. Memory is not a unitary function of the mind. There are two major classes of memories. One is called explicit memory or declarative memory. It's what you conventionally think of as memory, recalling people, places, and objects. Okay. The other is called implicit memory, and that is a memory for perceptual and motor skills, riding a bicycle, hitting a tennis ball. When you drive and you shift, you don't pay attention. You don't tell yourself, I have to move the gear shift this way. You do it automatically after you've learned sure. it. Implicit memory, the reflexive memory, is unconscious. You have to pay attention when you learn it, but once you do it, boom, it's automatic. Explicit memory, recalling your first television program, your first love experience, your first child. It's a conscious recall, so they're fundamentally different. They involve different areas of the brain. Mm -hmm. The critical structure in explicit memory storage, in memory of people, places, and objects, is a region called the hippocampus. And this was first discovered by Brenda Milner, who's a spectacular psychologist, now in the 80s, uh, at McGill. And she studied this patient H.M., a very famous patient. Somebody on a bicycle knocked H.M. over, mm -hmm. gave him a bilateral concussion, and he developed seizures in both sides. After a while, they became intractable. So when he was 20, he was operated on. And the surgeon, Dr. Scoville, removed the temporal lobes in both sides. And he went deep and he removed the hippocampus in both sides. And he left H.M. with a devastating memory loss. H.M. could now no longer take in any more new memories 
and form them as long-term memories. So the ability to form long-term memory absolutely requires the hippocampus, and it came out of Scoville's surgery, and HM had such difficulty that when Brenda Milner would come to visit him, and she did this on a monthly basis for about 20 years, every time she walked into the room, it was as if he never saw her before. Now, he could do implicit things perfectly well. He could comb his hair, he could shave, he could do all this stuff. But anything that involved conscious recall, reading the newspaper, he'd read one paragraph, he'd forget the whole thing, he'd start all over again. This was just a remarkable distinction between these two kinds of memory processes. Some of the most highly trained Western physicians are interested in using our ability to actually map the brain and apply that to meditation. What are the chances we're overstating the potential of that? I think zero. I mean, meditation is an interesting mind state. The brain is in a particular functional state which gives you certain calm, certain focus of attention, allows you to control your body in certain ways. It would be wonderful to understand that. You know, these are the challenges young people should be taking on. You don't want to take a problem that's beaten into the ground. You want to take a problem that's opening up. And I think this is a fantastic problem. Uh, to define situations for hypnosis, one might be able to do certain kinds of dental procedures with hypnosis. I'm only, you know, this is not an area I'm specialized in. But understanding special mental states is extremely important. We know so little about the major mental illnesses. Depression or schizophrenia, we just have the vaguest idea of perhaps this region is involved or that region is involved. We need to understand the anatomical basis for major mental illness in order to make any progress in treating it more effectively. And this is a major, major problem. There's been no improvement in the treatment of schizophrenia since the 1960s. The new drugs have fewer side effects than chlorpromazine, which was available to us then, but they are no more effective, by and large, with some minor exceptions. Selective serotonin uptake inhibitors like Prozac have been around since, you know, 1980. No improvement has occurred. So we're stuck here. I want to get back to these Buddhist monks who have practiced meditation for decades on end. But they are not scientists. They are not people of medicine. How much is it to be learned from their experience with meditation that can be applied to real science? Uh, I think an enormous amount. Now, let me step back and put this in a larger perspective. When neurobiology began to be more powerful than it was before, people thought, these neurobiologists are going to come along and they're going to wipe out psychology. I mean, everything we know up to this point is folk psychology. It's what your mother taught you. That's probably malarkey. They're going to come along, well, they're going to have a completely new understanding. Well, that's nonsense. You know, what we have learned from Freud, I mean, some of it is wrong, a lot of it is right. What we've learned from various people, from Skinner, from Thorndike, from Pavlov, these are profound insights that we've gotten. The function of science is to get a new level of understanding and to develop a new science, a merger mm -hmm. of psychology with neurobiology. In fact, modern neuroscience is the synthesis. So if meditation is a new insight into the mind, we want to understand it. Why not? You know, artists and thinkers about behavior often get very profound insights into what's important to people and what people respond to. Even religion, I mean, religion fascinates me. I'm not a religious person, but it's clear that this must be in some way instinctive, inborn. I mean, wherever you go throughout the world, people create religions for themselves, just like they create art. So to understand what is the evolutionary drive? Is it the concern about mortality, that we're ultimately gonna die? or that there's mystery in the world and we're uncomfortable with it, unstructured, we have to develop some kind of a mythology about it. But what is it in the brain that requires that we have art? We don't need it. We, it's not essential for survival. It doesn't, it's not food. It's not protection. But it enriches our life. Religion enriches people's lives. So to understand that, even though it comes completely from non-scientific sources, is terrific. 
Now, some are silly. I think mental telepathy is nonsense. You know, I don't communicate with a guy in New Jersey by thinking thoughts. But that's a personal opinion. There are a few characters out there who believe in mental telepathy. I think one has to use one's judgments about the fact that there are some folk ideas that are just plain nonsense. But many things, I mean, I've seen people meditate and I've seen how they can strengthen their stomach and boy, you can kick them in the belly and they don't feel it. That's amazing. They, you and I can't handle a blow like that. To understand what is it about the brain that allows them to fend off an insult like that is remarkable. I want to understand. You must be doing it through your brain. You know, pain is a brain perception, just like touch and sight. So if you become insensitive to pain, something in the pain pathway is shut off. Wouldn't it be wonderful to know how that works? You know, people have pain from all sorts of causes to know how to modify that. In fact, I would say that of the problems in medicine, one of the most bothersome ones are various chronic pain syndromes. We have very few good approaches to chronic pain. We can treat acute pain, go to a dentist, he gives you an injection, boom, or you take an analgesic. But chronic pain, very difficult. If we had other ways of doing this, it would be terrific. Do you or do you not consider the brain the, the last frontier of It is medicine? without doubt the last frontier of science. To understand how you work, to understand how the inner parts of your psyche operate, it's fantastic. This makes us who we are. You want to know what it's like in Mars? Who do you think that curiosity comes from? It comes from your squash. It comes from your brain. All the questions we ask of the world come from it. You call it the squash sometimes? Is that, is that what doctors call it? <laughs> the brain is a better term. <laughs> <laughs>